I want you to know that God chose you. I want you to know that God chose this church. I want you to know that God makes choices. He has made choices. And so I want to take a look back a little bit deeper into this issue. Uh, for some of you, um, Romans chapter 9 will become a revisit on this revelation, but I think that we have to keep our soul plugged into it lest we fade out of the revelation and then it ceases to have effect on our lives. How many know that God spoke to you powerful things and then two years later you can't remember what it was? And you think, I changed my life. I can't even think what was. So I write everything down. I have notes everywhere. I got drawers full of sermons and full of notes. You know, I was realizing the other day I was going through piles and piles and piles and piles and piles and piles, and piles of my sermons, Marjorie. We're cleaning out this drawer. And I was like, there's no end to this drawer. And there's like no books upon no books. And I started opening and flipping, and I was trying to get rid of some stuff. And I had one of my original notebooks back when we first started church. And I was reading it. And I'm looking, and the print was so small. Somehow I could read that and see that. And I wrote so tiny. And I was looking at it, and I was reading And the revelation was there. You understand that, that, that deep personal relationship with Christ and then the, the transforming our lives issues of becoming a call of God to pro proclaim his message everywhere in the earth. You know, it was there, and I was reading through it, and I, I wanted to chuck this old little notebook, but I couldn't. It was like Grandma's Bible. <laughs> it was her knickknack or something, but I put it back <laughs> in the drawer. And um, I want you to know that things... I have forgotten 35 years ago were in that book, revelations that God spoke to me. You understand? Write things down. Make notes. Take God serious at his word. Uh, someone once said they were sitting here, and after they were here a few months, they said, I'm going to take this sonship for a ride and see what it can do. <laughs> I said, I like that. Take it for a ride. Take God at his word. Taste and see if the Lord is good. Taste and see. The Lord says, you have not, because you ask not. I'm big time asker lately. Wow. The more I grow in the Lord, the more I'm asking for. It's like, well, you know what? If it's in your will here, let it rip. <laughs> you know? I'm ready for that. I'm more ready now than I ever have been. I hope you're getting ready for greater and greater blessings. Well, you know, the greatest thing that's ever going to happen to you is when you die. Because the perishable will be removed, and the imperishable will live forever. And you will see, not with clouded eyes, but exactly what God was saying to you the whole time. The only difference is, right now, you are more blessed than those who see, because you, by faith, can embrace the Word of God and see it come to pass. And God said that's better than seeing. Wow. Anybody can do what they see. But who can see by the Spirit and do? And God is impressed with that. He loves the faith of his people. Can you turn to Romans chapter 9, please? Romans chapter 9. I hope you got the first three sermons. Um, life is pouring out of heaven. I'm not trying to mess with you. But you know what? God can't die. Can you say God can't die? But Jesus died. But God can't die. So what it does, it should awaken in you that there's, there's a, a uniqueness about Jesus from God the Father that you ought to recognize. If you don't recognize that, you won't realize how included you are. Because everything Jesus did represents us. And so it's powerful. It's powerful. That's a strange thought, right? <laughs> Can we pick it up in verse 4? This is Romans chapter 9, verse 4. We're speaking concerning the choice of God. Who are the Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises? Of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came? Who is over all the eternal blessed God. Amen. For it is not that word 
the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. They are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. Did you know that Abraham had children? I wrote down the names of his children, Isaac, Ishmael, Zimran, uh, Jackshaw, uh, Medan, Midian, Is Is Iskbar, and Shua. And he had all these sons. So remember that when God made a promise to Abraham, he said, in you is a seed, and then through that seed, I'm gonna bless the whole entire world. But he didn't pick Midian, Ish Ishbak, or any of the other brothers, he chose Isaac. So I want you to know that the nature of God chooses things. God's a chooser. You have to know something about God in heaven. He chooses. He has chosen from the beginning of time. If you think about it, really, when, when uh, Adam and Eve had, you know, Cain and Abel, he chose Abel and not Cain, as far as the sacrifice was concerned. They both brought their sacrifices to God, and he chose Abel's, but he did not choose Cain's. And then Cain got mad, and he was really frustrated and angry, and the Lord says to him, what do you say? If you do the right thing, will you not be blessed? If you do the right thing, will you not be blessed? But God chose Abel. Because Abel did not bring from the sweat of his brow from the goods of the, of the land of his own labor, but he brought from the cattle which self-produce through the blood. Now it's funny how spiritually something about Abel perceived the blood, perceived the offspring, and brought it to God as an offering because it wasn't the labor of his own hands. But Cain brought the labor of his hands of the field. And God says, I don't accept that. I accept that. And so sometimes God makes choices that can make you mad. But you had better get over yourself because he will never change to accommodate your stubbornness. He says, if you do the right thing, will I not accept you? So you have to know from the beginning until now, God has never rejected anybody because of who they are, but because of what they chose. Okay, so you have to understand the choice of God. God chose Abel. So he says here, we're in Romans chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God had taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. So Christ, Jesus, was only going to come through Isaac. It was not going to come through any of the other children. The only salvation for Abraham's other children was through Isaac's seed. There was no other choice God was going to make. God always chooses how he's going to bring salvation to the general people through individual people. And we're going to, this scripture, uh, Apostle Paul lays it out quite well. And he says, uh, verse 8, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as seed. So you have to really understand, I've tried to emphasize this over the past 20 years, over and over and over and over, to try and get people to understand it, because it's so ingrained in our society. You know, we, we call ourselves a, a Christian Judeo country, based on the, that thing. And I think the idea of Judeo then seems to highlight a fleshly group of people rather than a spiritual order. But you have to know, even Judeo, all who are called Jews are not Jews. All the children who came in the, were of the flesh were not of the promise, but the children of promise were the ones that God chose. God didn't choose all of Israelites. He chose the children of promise. He never chooses all. He chooses a certain segment of all so that he can save the rest. And so uh, you have to understand then um, that Jesus said, go everywhere, preach 
preach and proclaim that the kingdom of God has come to you back in Israel, the nation. So they're going to village after village after village saying the kingdom of God has come there. The kingdom of God has come there. The kingdom of God has come there. And how did they prove it? They'd heal the sick, open the blind eyes, raise the dead, and do all the things Jesus told them to do as a witness to the people that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he says, tell them the kingdom of God is at hand and it is about to be launched upon you. Because God, through Jesus Christ, was going to establish his kingdom on the earth in the midst of them in that day. It's not in our future. It was in theirs that it was about to happen. And so they went everywhere. He says, whatever house you go into, let your peace come upon them. So the word peace in the Greek means a mended relationship. Let the peace that you have with God through me, let that come upon that household so they can have mended relationship with God. He said, but if they reject you, let your peace return to you and shake the dust off your sandals as a witness against them. Can you imagine, imagine all these guys outside the door? <laughs> He's like, what is this call? <laughs> <laughs> well, you think it's not some strange, mythical, legendary idea of some mystical thing. No, he's saying you are the dust of the earth, the children of the flesh, because you rejected the message of God. You are not the promised children, oh, which are the stars of heaven, which are going to inherit the promise. So it became a witness against them. It's, it's funny how whenever you get into this subject matter, people get so confused because they have... They have like a, a real bent on proving something. But the Bible tells us plainly that not all of Israel was Israel. Can you say amen? amen. All right, I got third of you. That's good. All right, so uh, there's no virtue. There is no virtue whatsoever in the flesh. No nation. No ethnic group. There's no virtue in it when it comes to the eternal things of God. No flesh. Shall, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Can we say it together? No flesh shall inherit the kingdom of God. No flesh? Not Jewish Jesus? No. Jesus is not a Jew. Jesus is a resurrected son of the most high God who has um, anesthetized into something far greater than any fleshly thing. Our future is greater than our present because we'll put on a body that equals the spiritual sons that we are today. That is awesome. Your future is the greatest thing you have. But you possess today the blessing of the seed of God inside of you. Amen. So he goes on to say, I'll read verse 8 again, just for the sake of context. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time, I will come and Sarah will conceive. So God said to Abraham, he said, I will come and Sarah will conceive because they, they had no child. He's saying, I'm going to bless you, and in you a seed's going to come. He's talking about the blessing of Isaac, not Ishmael, not the other brothers. Ishmael wasn't bad, and these are good. It wasn't about that. It was about God didn't choose that one, and he didn't choose the rest of them. He chose Isaac. So God makes choices. Can you say God makes choices? And not only this choice, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children yet not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls. Wow. So here's the deal. You know, Isaac, <laughs> I always get these days mixed up, but <laughs> so he, he didn't choose any of the other offspring. He chose Isaac. And then he didn't choose any of their kids. He chose Jacob. So they, had, they went on to have several children, but he only chose one because it's according to God's choice 
neither had done good or bad, that they might have any advantage over the other, because it's not according to the flesh or according to the achievements of man. It's according to the choice of God. Can you say the choice of God? Okay, so he goes on and he says, verse 12, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. Wow. This must have been like a, an amazing moment, especially Jewish culture. The firstborn son was like, that was everything. In fact, you think about Passover, was about the firstborn son being protected from death. And now he's saying he's going to serve the younger one. They're like, whoa, this is all messed up. This is a little bit like uh, when um, the father of John the Baptist, um, the priest, Zacharias, thank you. When Zechariah was in the temple doing his lighting candles and things, he, <laughs> he, uh, the angel said, all right, your wife's going to have a son, and you're going to name him John. He was like, what? No, he, he got mad. See, culture and tradition always tries to trump God and his ultimate will. You have to be careful that your culture, we're talking about American culture right now. You got to be careful that your American culture doesn't trump the will of God. Like, for example, you say, well, I'm going to date and I'm going to start kissing and making out with girls and see which one I like. Well, that culture contradicts the culture of heaven. The culture of heaven says a man ought not to touch a woman and that a younger man should treat the younger girls as their own sister. Now, if you can make out with your sister, you got problems. But our culture says it's okay. But we don't go with our culture. We go with the choice of God. His word is a choice. He's chosen something for us. If you want the favor and the blessing of God, withdraw from the systems and principles of this world and the choices of this world. Why are you angry? If you do what's right, will you not be blessed? So you say, well, if I was there, I wouldn't do it. Well, you have your choice now. Yeah, there you are. You're free to choose. God said you're free to choose. So now you are Cain. Every day. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, praise the Lord. Well, we choose right. We choose the Word of God. Amen. Verse 13. Well, do I want to? I might bounce out. Yeah, let's read verse 13. Uh, as it is written, Jacob, I have loved. Isn't that wonderful? But Esau, I have hated. Oh, my gosh. You know, it goes on later and says, well, then who can resist the will of God? He hates me. He's already chosen against me. He loves him, hates me. Well, you know what that's going to create? rebellion. If you choose one of your kids over the other, the other children are going to feel pushed aside and it's going to cause problems inside of them. But if your choice of one of your kids causes an advantage to come to the other kids, then they rejoice in your choice. Right? And so this scripture is mistranslated and you have to understand, people don't like it when you say stuff like that, but Greek can go this way or that way, and it just all depends on the heart of the person who's interpreting. And, you know, people, there's a lot of people say King James only. We don't talk that way. Thee and thou is not a good translation. It's me and you. Okay, so we have to understand translations of the Bible the only way a translation could be good is if it stays up to date in a modern context of our language. If it doesn't, if, if we had a translation now, say the Bible said, well, that's cool. <laughs> it would be old. We'd have to get a new <laughs> translation. So what would we say today, kids? A little louder? Jackson, come on, help me out here. That's, that's rad? What would you say? Jesus was, what, what? That's fat. Oh. So you'd read the Bible and say, Jesus was fat. 
But if you go back in time, they say, Jesus was fat. Why did he control himself? See, a translation is relevant to the understanding of that people. The only way I can know what's in God's heart is if the translation conveys what he was trying to say, not what they said in King James' day. Right? Does that make sense? I think that's pretty logical. <laughs> perfect. Oh, wow. Perfect. So he says, for it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Now this word, uh, hated, in the Greek is actually the word disregarded. And that's a whole different subject matter than hatred. If I hate you, I'm going to hell. That's what the Bible says. God, you're going to hell if you hate, it. <laughs> if you hate Esau. No, God doesn't hate. God does not hate. He chooses. So when he was going through Abraham's sons, he chose Isaac. When he was going through Jacob and Esau, he chose Jacob and disregarded Esau as the choice, not of life. God doesn't disregard people. He chooses to save them through his choices. God's plan for Esau was in Jacob. God's plan for Irish was in Jacob. When God's choice for Pakistanis was in Jacob. You understand? The seed that Christ would come and save the whole entire world was God's choice in Isaac and then in Jacob and then through the tribe of Judah. You understand? And then Jesus was born because Jesus... about this and uh, you know Job's buddies there they said Job your secret sins have been found out Job says I have not committed a sin he says oh you can say with your mouth your boastful prideful mouth but God sees behind the scene he saw your sins and now he's judging you he says I did not sin he goes I don't know why he is finding fault with me but there's no fault with me big mistake Big mistake. Do you know one thing you should learn right up front is God has never been wrong. And he's not starting with you. So, you know, you can say, why'd you give me this woman? He didn't. You chose her. And you asked for her. So I gave her to you. Because you asked for her. So now she is my choice for you because you covenanted according to your choice with her. Now stand with her and beat the odds. Yeah. Come on, man. Amen. And uh, so people have all kinds of excuses. Well, this marriage isn't working out. Did God change his mind? <laughs> no, you chose. Say, I chose. <laughs> Okay, and I love Margie anyway, so it's easy for me to preach this. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I have compassion. So then, it is not of him who runs, or wills, or of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. There's nobody here in Christ who God didn't have mercy on. 
He looked at your present estate, had mercy, overlooked all your sins, put them on Jesus Christ, killed him in your stead, and then you came, he then sent preachers to preach to you about the cross of Christ and what Jesus did for you before you were even born, before you even sinned, before you did anything wrong, because God loved you so much he wanted to redeem you before you did anything wrong. And they preached it to you, and you went, oh my God, thank you, Lord. And you received the forgiveness of your sins, and you entered into covenant with God because God chose you in Christ before the foundations of the world. It's God's choice. It's never man's choice. You never chose God, ever. He chose you and revealed himself to you. And the only thing you could do is respond by faith or not. Nobody on this earth is ever going to decide to choose Jesus one day. Never. If God doesn't reveal him to you, you can't see him. And the Bible says that. And boy, there's a lot of people who can't see him. But they can if they allow their heart to change. That's where we're going next. You ready? Wow, stop interrupting me. What time is it? 11? Ooh, we're doing good. It says, uh, <clears throat> verse 17, so God had spoke to Moses. I love it that he spoke to Moses. I'll have mercy on whom I brought have mercy. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, even for this same purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. What do you think? Oh, my gosh. Well, that's it. God hardened Pharaoh. What choice did he have? He resisted Moses. That's the end of the story. Look, let's not forget the fact that there was a other Pharaoh 400 years earlier. Because remember that for 430 years, Israel, the nation, went into Egypt under Joseph and that Pharaoh. And if you think about it, Egypt was a powerful nation which was rising in the earth even higher and Joseph, who was sold out by his brothers in Israel as a slave, was taken into Egypt. And then he was accused of adultery by Potiphar's wife, which he did nothing. Then he was thrown in jail for all this stuff. And he's in jail for years and years. But his wisdom was so great because God had already chose him. So I want you to know something. The presence of trials or problems in your life does not undo the choice of God. When you feel like God abandoned you, you might be right in the prison cell that's going to lead to the victory. Because God has a greater plan than just your little comfort for today. He has a plan to bring Israel, the ones who sold you into slavery, out of starvation into Egypt to rescue them through the famine. And so Joseph rises up and becomes a, a great wise man in the eyes of the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh looked at Joseph. And uh, the Pharaoh saw Joseph as God's choice. He says, the, your God, the wisdom of your God rests upon you. I know what I'll do. I'll promote you over the whole land. Now that's a wise Pharaoh. Because the purposes of God and the plans of God are going to manifest through Pharaoh because God chose Joseph. See, he chose Pharaoh for this purpose. That he might manifest his power in him. Except this time it was through the choice of Joseph. And he cooperated with God's choice. And what happened? This great nation of Egypt became way greater. Why? Because the whole known world had to come to them in a seven-year famine to buy grain from them, and they became exceedingly wealthy and exceedingly strong and exceedingly powerful in the land. Why? Because they saw the choice of God in Joseph. Can you say God chose Joseph? So then, just a mere 400 years later, um, well, that generation's gone, all new leaders. They totally forgot about the choice of God, and they had been persecuting, busy persecuting Israel, the nation, and putting them to forced labor for, as slaves. So I found this interesting fact today that it really struck me that um, Joseph was about 30 years old when he came into that place. 
And Moses was in Midian with his father-in-law, just about to see the burning bush when Joseph died. It's amazing, the anointing of God's choice on Joseph in the death of Joseph, the transfer of the anointing went to Moses, whom God then calls him to become the deliverer of Israel. It's like timing, like wow. So it's like this, uh, this, this, this amazing timing was going on. Um, so anyway, um, Joseph was raised up, and they cooperated. Pharaoh cooperated with him. But now Moses is raised up, and this Pharaoh, it's an amazing thing that this Pharaoh decides, I'm hardening my heart against you. Now you say that how can you resist God because you harden your heart? Can you read this scripture with me really quickly? I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm just going to breeze through a few scriptures to help you see it. This is Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Beware, brethren, lest there be any evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Exhort one another daily, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Beware, lest any of you become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see that? Hardening... When God hardens someone, it's because they've chosen sin over his purpose and his choice, right? So it's not just God saying, all right, I'm hardening you and I'm choosing you. That's not what it's about. This Pharaoh decided to fight against God, so God hardened him. So make sure you read that into the scripture so you don't see it wrong. Romans chapter 11 and verse 22 to 23. Behold the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell severity, but towards you, goodness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off if they do not continue in unbelief and they will be grafted in again. So you can see then, I think I misspoke a minute ago. I want to just correct what I said it's in my head, floating around my head. Um, Joseph in his death, what I'm saying is the anointing hung there over the nation. And all the way, years later, until Moses came along, the anointing that was on Joseph now fell on on Moses. The anointing of Joseph now was on Moses as God's choice 400 years later. And so here all these years later God had not changed his mind about what he's going to do and how he's going to bring deliverance and now the anointing that was on Joseph it falls on to Moses and Moses becomes the great deliverer of Israel. So make sure you're aware of that. God's choices cannot fall. Proverbs 28, verse 14 says, Happy is the man who always is reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. So the first Pharaoh was happy. The second Pharaoh, under Moses, his heart was hardened, and he fell under calamity. Also it says in Romans chapter 9, verses 19 through 21, that there are vessels of honor and there are vessels of dishonor. He says, if you cleanse yourself from your wicked ways, you can go from a vessel of dishonor to a vessel of honor, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is God does not create evil vessels of dishonor. God does not harden people's hearts. And God does not choose against you and hate you. God chooses someone through which you can be saved, through his favor can flow out to you, because God suffers that all should be saved and none should be lost. See, the choice of God was in Isaac, and it was in Jacob, and it was then through his lineage, through the tribe of Judah, and then it was Jesus, because Jesus was the original choice of God way right from the beginning, before the foundations of the world. God already chose Jesus, but he chose a lineage of a natural people to bring about the birth of the Savior of the world. And God made a choice. Can you say God made a choice? God made a choice. And he chose us in Christ. You will say to me then, why does he find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made us like this? Does not the potter have po power over the clay from one lump to make a vessel of honor and another of, now it says dishonor, but it means to be less esteemed. So you esteem Jesus above all men. 
But all men then are elevated through Jesus to a, a level of sonship. So your blessing is in him. What if God wanted to show his wrath and make known his power, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory to the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand. So I want you to know that from the foundations of the world, God chose everybody in Christ. But until this hour, not everybody chooses God through Christ. So he already chose everybody through Christ. But not everybody chooses him through Christ. It is, it is the choice of God is all that matters. It doesn't matter how great a pharaoh is. It doesn't matter how great a king is, a priest is, or some famous person. It doesn't matter how big a mouth they have or what things they boast. There is no salvation in any other name than the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other salvation. There's no one else can transform your life because God didn't choose anybody else. And he didn't choose a Jew. He chose a lineage to bring about a son to not just save Jews, but every single race of people on the entire planet. Because his plan was before the beginning of time to bring Christ into the world to save all people. Can you say all people? So now a couple scriptures make more sense. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, He chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 17, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, it says, uh, also, I'm just thinking of scripture now. It says, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, God will do for you. Because he's the choice of God. Whatever you ask in my name, I'll do for you. But he says, the day is coming when you, you won't ask me, but you ask the Father himself, for he loves you himself. Just ask him my name. Because he's the choice. So let's say you've got a dad of a household. And you say, uh, you know, I'm going to do thus and thus. And you don't have dad's approval. It doesn't work. Because he has the authority to decide whether or not it's going to stand. But if the dad says to, me, says to you, son, here, here's my signet ring. This represents my name and the family name. Whatever you buy, whatever you do, do it with this. I back it. It's the same thing. That signet ring backs you with the authority of that name of that person who's in charge. And it grants you all the privileges of that person. And so we have all the privileges of the person of Jesus Christ. This is why we worship him. This is why we honor him. This is why he's our eldest brother and he's, he's the name that is above every name. Can you say the name that is above every name? There's no higher name than the name of Jesus. In my life, it seems like I'm constantly encountering people with different opinions. How about you? <laughs> but they want to tell me. In fact, Ava just told me this morning, my granddaughter, we were, in, uh, we were at the bookstore the other day, and I was looking through the science books. I like, um, you know, quantum physics and quantum science and molecular structure stuff. And I was just kind of looking to see what they had. And this guy comes up and he goes, look how few books there are in science. No wonder it's the condition of our society. And he walked away. And she looked at me and she goes, Papa, why do people want to say things to you? She goes, when I'm walking, they don't say anything to me. But when you're around, they all want to say something. I say, I know, it just follows me around. It's like, <laughs> it's, and it's like it happens. But there's, it's because there is a choice of God on individuals beyond Christ. He chooses apostles. He chooses pastors. He chooses business leaders. He chooses people to do certain things. You have to understand, if you're chosen to do what you're doing, then it's more than your muscle and sweat to cause it to be successful. If I can get past the fact that I think that it's just my will and my effort and my own might that causes things to happen, then I, by faith, can reach to God to receive help from heaven to achieve his will. Right? Yeah, it's like, I don't need to sweat the details. God called me to do it. 
Someone says, well, how hard do you have to work for a sermon? I wake up. Yeah, well, I know, but you got to study. you got to put your notes in order. I know the Bible. It's like leaping out of my head all the time. I'm, sometimes I say, God, can't we have a quiet moment where I don't have to think about this stuff? It, a, when you have a gift, you don't have to say to someone, um, well, like, let's, let's just do it. Where's Christy? Christy, stand up. What, what's the Lord saying right now? Come on. Look, at she jumps right up. She's ready. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I just saw that in the spirit, there's just this scramble. It's just a scramble of everything that's going on and what's happening in the world and, and everything. And the spirit of God wants to calm that scramble in your mind. And I, I just want you to know, like, some people are afraid. Oh, is this the end of the world? I want to address your doctrine right now. Like, God already, like, Apostle Chris was already preaching about this. God already said, no. I'm not accepting your sacrifice. Your sacrifice is no good. People's sacrifice is no good to him. He already took the sacrifice of Jesus. And what I'm seeing now is that if you think that you're not in a scramble, I want to show you that you are. And that is you've given more power to whether you should or shouldn't get a vaccine because you've been serving the God of fear in your heart. That's how you know that you're a part of the scramble. What about God over getting it or not getting it? What about God? I, I, God wants to deliver the scramble out of your mind. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay, so point proven. All right, so she has a prophetic gift. So she doesn't wake up and go, what am I going to prophesy? It's on her. So I call her, and there it comes. Boom, it comes out. So each of us have gifts. Gifts allow you to do things that other people would find difficult. What if I call you right now to come up here and prophesy? You'd be like, oh, don't, please don't call me. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm just thinking, who am I going to call? No, I'm not going to call you. But if you if you are a singer, I'd say, why don't you come up here and sing? I, I won't be afraid. I'd say, well, go ahead, Aaron. Why don't you sing? And I won't be afraid of what comes out of his mouth because he has a gift to sing, right? He can sing. I could call on a bunch of people who could sing. You could call me to preach because I'm gifted to preach. I'm gifted to convey the revelation of heaven. It's what he gave me. But what are you gifted with? So when I wake up, I have to say, Lord, what do you want to say? How do you want to say it? Lead me. Show me. Bring a light upon the scriptures you want me to speak to the people of God. But you should wake up and say, Lord, this is the business that you have me building. This is the world you have me built, uh, sowing into. This is the class I'm supposed to teach. You should say, Lord, Enlighten me as to what you want to convey through my life, through this business, through this, through this ministry of teaching kids or of whatever it is you're called to do. What if you're in the government? Well, you should be praying for the wisdom of God to come upon you to lead the people into truth and into life and into righteousness and against more immorality and wickedness. Amen. Right. So, but I think most people wake up and say, well, it's Monday. <laughs> Dang. The weekend's over. Oh. And then they think, oh, I should pray. I don't have time. I got to take a shower and get to work. And what do you do on the way to work? Turn on the radio when you could have been praying. Because it's not about you want to pray or don't want to pray. You're just so busy with life separate from God that you don't take time for God. Rather, shut it off and pray for five minutes on the way to work. They'd give you five times seven a week. They give you 35 minutes. You talk to God. Wow. Boy, you guys are quiet today. Uh, sorry, I'm preaching the truth. I don't need your agreement. But I'd love for you to agree so that you can have the blessing come upon you because God chose you in Christ and your life is blessed in Christ. Outside of Christ, your life is not blessed. Look, if I was in business, I would have a successful business because I am blessed in Christ. If I was a teacher, I'd be good at teaching in the schools or wherever I teach or whatever I do because I'm in Christ and I'm called to do it. If I was a husband, I am. I'd be good at it because I'm called in Christ to be a husband. I'm not called to be single. How about you? All right, so let's say you're single and you don't want to be single. Well, God doesn't want you to be single because he made you with desires. And therefore, he 
not you. He wants to raise up a spouse for you, but you're so busy struggling about trying to get a spouse, you never look to him and ask him, Lord, would you help me find my way through because I've got the whole thing messed up. See, sometimes we mess it up with our own unbelief and we're struggling in our blood, but God already chose you in Christ. He already planned every single factor of your life out if you would just give him a shot and let him begin to do something for you. You say, well, yeah, my wife divorced me. Well, God is the expert at reconciliation. Not necessarily with that person, but he'll raise a spouse back up that will love you and care for you and you can care for them. He's a God of the restoration. Well, I committed abortion. What can I do? Receive his forgiveness once and for all and stop blaming yourself for what you can't change. And get up and say, I'm going to make a difference with my life. Instead of going the wrong way, I'm now going to do what's right in the sight of God. You see, because God chose you in Christ with and without your mistakes. And Christ cleanses you from all your mistakes. Does, do I know what I'm talking about? I'm not lying. I wish I had time. I'd take you into Hebrews 6 and talk about the promise of God and he's, how he swore an oath that he would not relent. Whatever he chooses to do, is a guarantee. Whatever he chooses to do is a guarantee for you. It includes us all. There's nobody excluded. The worst sinner, the worst wicked murderer, the worst person on the planet, God is already trying to redeem them. He's already busy chosen them in Christ, but they just have to choose to come into Christ. They've got to make the decision to surrender to his will. Can you stand, please? Won't you surrender to his will? Won't you surrender to his will? Won't you surrender? Close your eyes, please. I just ask you, if you would, just respect people for a minute. You know, today is the day of salvation. It's not tomorrow, it's today. When tomorrow comes, it'll still be today. When the next day comes, it'll still be today. God is not the God of tomorrow or yesterday. God is a living God. He's the God of today. Today, Jesus saves. Today, God will rescue you. Today, if you will call upon the Lord and put your confidence in Him, He will save you to the uttermost. But if you wait until tomorrow, it'll never come because today is the day of salvation. God is calling people right now. And I'm asking you to shoot your hand up in the air. If you would like to receive Christ today, throw your hand in the air. Put it up so I can see it. Yeah, I see the hand. Yes, I see those hands. Yes, I see those hands. And uh, so look, all four of you, is there anybody else? You know, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day God rescues people. Today's the day he changes what was into what he intended from the beginning. He is the God of restoration. He'll wipe out your past because he puts you in Christ and gives you a brand new future because he is the choice of God and he has the capacity to do for you what nobody else can do for you. So why don't you pray with me if you lifted your hand today? And I, you know, it doesn't matter to me whether you've been in church or not in church. It doesn't matter to me where you are or what you've done. What matters to me is that today your faith is saying, I need Jesus Christ. You can just put your hand down and come on, everybody open your eyes. I want you to do this with your eyes open. Why don't we all pray it together? But especially those who lifted your hand, I want you to pray from your heart to God. You close your eyes if you need to. But say, Father, God. I want your choice for my life. I don't want to miss out on what you have for me. My faith is stirred up right now. I see that Jesus is your choice. And I choose him. I put my life into him. And I'm asking you to transfer his work into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. I receive the forgiveness of all my sins. I am not what I used to be. I am now forgiven of all my past. Now help me forget about the things that once held me. Now Jesus Christ, I invite your spirit into my life. Build your home in me. Have your way in me. Teach me. 
Show me the new life you have for me. I'm ready to move forward with you. Thank you today for my salvation. I am in the choice of God. Amen. Your goodness is right now.